Hoping everybody is ready to go through this PowerPoint on beneficial insects. Um, I am Kelly Alsup and I'm a horticulture educator and I'm based out of Bloomington. So I serve Livingston, McLean and Woodford County counties and I am uh, going to present today. So I wanted to thank uh, Kari, Candace, and Martha for having me present on absolutely one of my favorite topics, which is insects, but more so than just insects, beneficial insects. My story really started off as I was, um, and if you've ever been in one of my uh, Master Gardener trainings, you might have heard this story before, but bear with me. It really starts with me being a greenhouse grower. And um, I started off at the U of I. And I was growing, I was responsible for a portion of plants. And mostly what I grew were either um, research plants or plants for classes for identification purposes. And so, um, Every Thursday, I would go through and I would scout my greenhouses and I would find tons of insect pests. Well, um, if I'm, you know, growing the most common research plants at the University of Illinois, which are corn and soybeans, and I have thrips or spider mites that have attacked them, I've got to take care of those thrips or spider mites or I'm not going to get good seed set. So um, after I scouted my greenhouse, I would put on my what I call my marshmallow man suit and I'd look a little bit like an alien or like I was going out into space and I'd start spraying chemicals. And at first it was okay for me. Um, I would see some kill and would be happy with what was going on. But when you have um, a crop in your greenhouse for more than three or four months, you start rotating through your chemicals really fast because when you spray a chemical, you always want to spray a different mode of action the next time so you don't start getting resistance. But that is exactly what was happening. I was getting resistance to the chemicals that I was using in the greenhouse. And it was very frustrating because when you um, when you sit when you stand up and you uh, you know spray and you know you know you're in this hot suit and you you know try to get good coverage and then you don't get good kill, you have to figure out what you're going to do because they it's a problem it has to be taken care of so. One of the things that my colleague and I is we started releasing beneficial insects in the greenhouse. And of course, it was very easy to get some people on board and it was very hard to get others on board. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's always worked this way. Why would we change it? Um, why, why invest money in these beneficial insects? But it actually, um, uh, worked out very, very well. And to this day, um, we have greenhouse grower, her name is Heather Lash, and she's there at the U of I growing soybeans and corn, just like I did, and she's still implementing these beneficial insects. So after I was a greenhouse grower, I became a horticulture educator, and I kind of had to translate that information that I learned of implementing beneficial insects to maybe helping gardeners attract them or even identify them. I think one of the things that we do is not particularly us, but um, maybe other types of gardeners, they look at an insect and they always think that it's bad. It's ne it can never be good. It's going to bite me, it's going to sting me, it's going to eat my plants. But to really get in there and look at what's in your uh, garden, you'll soon learn that there's tons of beneficial insects in your gardens 
that are taking care of pest problems that you probably didn't even know that you had. So we're going to go through some of those really common ones that you're going to find. One of my favorite things to do is to go into a garden and look for aphids because I call them aphids are big, they're dumb, and they're full of sugar and beneficial insects absolutely love them. So um, I've actually been um, scolded by some master gardeners where they're saying, stop looking at my insect infestations. And I'm like really proud of them for not spraying chemicals and having all these beneficial insects that I can look at. So even though they feel a little embarrassed, um, I love finding the insects and I love looking for them. So the first one we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about an aphid lion. What a cool name. Actually, it's called an aphid lion, but they say it looks like an alligator. I must say I kind of agree. It looks like a little alligator. Um, but it is ferocious like a lion. Um, it is the larva of a very common insect, and that insect is your green your green lacewing and so what the green lacewing does is it lays its eggs and I have a picture later on of the eggs and these larvae hatch and the uh, adult lacewing tends to go towards where the larva is going to have prey the the mouth whoa that's kind of uh, menacing looking, these really large curved mandibles. They're actually hollow. Um, they do, they can inject a paralyzing venom, but they can also, uh, they also extract the juices of the aphid. So it's not going to like chew the aphid. It's just going to suck the juices out of the aphid and throw the carcass down on the ground. And this little guy, which it, when I turn over a leaf that has an aphid infestation, I always find an aphid lion. He um, is going to eat about 600 aphids in 14 to 20 days. He may not completely eat aphids. He could go for other smaller body um, uh, invertebrates like a caterpillar, beetle, scale, mealybugs, leafhoppers, thrips, and mites. And in fact, in the industry, this guy has been used as a beneficial insect, purposely released for, you know, mealybug issues or leafhopper issues. For us in the greenhouse, this guy was a volunteer. And what I mean by that was, since we were releasing beneficial insects, we had to limit the type of chemicals that we were spraying. We could no longer spray stuff like organophosphates or carbamates, but we had to spray biological pesticides. And because we had done that, it, it stopped being such a toxic environment. And so beneficial insects would naturally come into the greenhouse, just like this little guy on the left, his, his mom laid an egg because it was no longer a toxic environment and she found plenty of aphids for her baby to eat. Now, this is a, a plant that Heather Lash kept for um, our greenhouse. So it was pepper plants and she allowed these aphids to infest this paper, pepper plant. And this aphid, uh, it's called a banker crop. These Aphids were to rear aphid parasitoids, and you'll see those later on in the PowerPoint. So because we had changed, stopped spraying the harsh chemicals, and started releasing our own beneficial insects, and then used chemicals like spinosad or neem oil that are much softer on beneficial insects, we were starting to get volunteers and this guy volunteered and he ate up those aphids um, so it was a wonderful thing all around um, so it may not you know you see in this Alex Wild picture Alex Wild by the way is one of my favorite insect photographers he's actually from originally University of Illinois has since moved to University of Texas 
and um, he has a quite an extensive collection of beautiful photographs of different insects and their behavior. So uh, shout out to Alex Wild for allowing me to capture this menacing insect going after what kind of looks like a ladybug larva to me. But, um, you know, uh, it just goes to show that some beneficial insects, they don't just go for the bad guys. They go for anything that's smaller than them and that they can suck the juices out of. On the uh, right side is a picture from a colleague. Now, this is an aphid lion that has covered its body with carcasses of old aphids, of aphids that it's already attacked, past victims, debris, organic debris like lichens or vegetation. Now, um, what bizarre behavior to cover yourself with your past victims. But this is um, um, kind of like a, 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 a very uh, cool adaption that this green, green lacewing has made to be able to get past ants. Now, we know that if you've ever seen um, an aphid infestation, you might see ants. And the ants are actually kind of farming those aphids because they want the honeydew and the honeydew is the frass, the poop, and they'll eat that. And so they'll actually protect those aphids from predators like this aphid lion and they might throw them away. They might push them off the plant or push them onto the ground. Well, when he's covered like this, he can actually sneak past those ants to go and get his food. So what a cool adaption, um, you know, cover yourself with aphid carcasses and lichens. So what a cool little picture. You see that beautiful little sickle shell, um, sickle um, shaped mouth. Um, here, here's me turning over a leaf. There's aphids in it and you can actually see, you know, there's my finger, it in, um, relationship to the finger um, just looks like a little small a little small alligator and it's got an aphid in its mouth and it's actually going to suck that aphid dry and then throw its carcass down or like in the previous slide it's probably going might actually uh, you know keep that carcass around I don't see any ants though but um, what a great adaption um, so you can actually and I see, hear garden speakers all the time talk about releasing green lace wings in their garden, especially if you had a huge aphid infestation on, let's say you had a tree and it was this really bad aphid infestation one year and you know the next year, you know, if you had one before, you're probably going to have another one. And, um, you know, you wanted to um, go ahead and, you know, buy some green lace wings eggs off the internet. Very cheap. Just put them near the ground. They'll eventually crawl up and look for their, um, uh, look for their, uh, their prey. Um, can actually work. Uh, so, and one of the things that is that they're probably not going to fly away. They're just going to crawl and look for their prey. So, uh, but uh, the one thing about beneficial insects that we did, Heather and I both learned in the greenhouse, was that it, will not, it is not a 100% cure. And what we had to do is we had to find the populations early on. And so if, we, if you have so many aphids that they're, you're dripping honeydew on your car, this is going to help but it's not going to take control of the whole infestation. You would probably have to spray uh, an insecticidal soap or some biological chemical that's labeled for aphids on that particular tree before you were to actually do a release. 
what I love about this is that a another I love insects. The, my favorite thing about the insects is how they've adapted in the simple ways they've adapted. This is green lacewing egg, and I see these all the time in the garden. And I think most of you gardeners are going to say the same thing. You're going to say, I've seen this white egg with a stalk. And sometimes it's single, and sometimes they're together like this. And so uh, why would you put your egg on a stalk? Uh, it prevents cannibalism or it from the other larva or perhaps ants. They don't know for sure. But uh, definitely to keep them up so nobody's going to try to eat the egg. So what a cool thing. Then you have your green lacewing on the right. I see these all the time in the garden. Feeding on pollen and nectar. And sometimes they feed on that honeydew. They have these beautiful kind of golden iridescent type of eyes. Green bodies. And most are active at night and have really delicate wings. But, um, you know, if you don't have in your garden the nectar and the pollen and the honeydew, you're probably not going to have the benefits of an aphid lion. So know that when you're trying to uh, foster beneficial insects that you want to foster all the life cycle. You want to make sure the mom has something to eat and the babies have something to eat. So... I guess that just goes to show you that you probably need to plant more flowers. Okay, now this is a different one. It's called an aphid parasitoid. And there are tons of parasitoids out there. They're everywhere. We just don't see them because they're so small. I mean, look at how small this parasitoid is in relationship to the aphid. And, you know, so uh, they're everywhere. The, now, these are perfectly, they're totally, excuse me, incapable of causing any human or animal any harm. Um, but they are extremely good beneficial insects because what they do is they lay their egg in the aphid. They pierce the skin with their ovipositor. And you see how she just really quickly pierces the skin. Now the aphid doesn't really do anything because it's, like I said before, they're big and dumb. And um, it's done once she does that. And it's really fast action. Just she's got them. And she will go through and she'll parasitize hundreds in a matter of a few days. Um, how do you know? that you have a parasitized aphid, you usually don't know right away. What happens is the larva, in a couple of days after the egg has been inserted, the larva starts to eat, and it looks like a grub, the inside of the aphid from the inside out. Then what it does is it fixes that aphid carcass to the leaf and begins to pupate. Now you'll see those big, uh, larger, they're kind of fatter, wider. They're called mummies. They look like paper. Now those are the parasitic wasps that are actually pupating. Now if you look closely, there's a couple of really fat aphids in there. And they look like they're about to blow up. Those are probably have already been parasitized and the um, and the the uh, larva is eating the inside of the aphid from eating it from the inside out so however menacing when you have an aphid infestation and you turn them over and you see these lovely paper mummies you know that nature has already taken care of this problem for you because after they've pupated, the at the very end by the cornicles, which I call the pooper shoots. I know not the most uh, professional word to use, but they're the two little protrusions off the end. They actually secrete the honeydew. Um, you'll see a little dot. Now none of these have hatched yet. But you'll see a little dot, and that's where the actual new parasitic wasp has emerged. 
Now, that parasitic wasp is going to take care of the rest of the population for you, no problem. Just one female. So you definitely don't want to spray this plant. You don't want to do anything to this plant. You don't want to knock those off. You don't want to do anything. Just let nature take its course. And the adults, what do the adults feed on? The adults like plants like anise or dill or parsley or mustard or little clovers. So again, if you don't have what the adult needs, you're not going to have the benefits of her laying the eggs in your aphids. Here's another picture, just uh, turned over a leaf. I think that's a uh, cabbage. And you see all those little green aphids in there, but you see right away, you see there's, you know, quite a few of big um, puffed out mummy aphids and you know I don't have to do anything because I have aphid parasitoids taking care of the problem for me. The next one is Hoover fly. I absolutely love the Hoover fly. I uh, love the Hoover fly. Probably uh, close to one of my favorite insects. I call him the great pollinator because he is a really wonderful pollinator. And you know if you um, look at a flower right now go to a garden you will probably see tons of hoover flies I feel like this right now is their peak season you also call them sweat bees so every time I'm at a fair and there's this little insect trying to eat my sweat and they do it's this guy he's not gonna sting you he's a fly he mimics bees and you know that because if you see, you look closely, you see two, uh, one set of wings. Beautiful. Then you see these two little small protrusions behind them. That Those are called hauteers. And that tells you that this guy is a fly, not a bee. And so he's really shiny. I always say um, shiny and two wings is a fly. And fuzzy and four wings is a bee. Clearly, you know, some of those wasps are not fuzzy, but they have four wings. And so this guy, even though he drinks your sweat, will never, ever sting you because he's incapable of it. He feeds on nectar and pollen. The reason they're called a hoover fly is because they can hoover over and they can fly backwards and fly sideways and fly forwards. So it's really kind of cool what they do. And so, like I said, I don't even have to give you a plant list because these guys are everywhere. You go to one of your favorite garden spots or even go out in your backyard, you have a lot of flowers, you're going to find them. Uh, again, especially right now. So they're extremely important pollinators. So not only are they important pollinators, but their larvae are extremely good beneficial insects and this is a picture on the left that was graciously given to me by one of my uh, master gardeners Margaret Hollowell um, a beautiful image she um, gave me this is a great big aphid eating maggot it is kind of yellowish or greenish legless and blind the mouth seizes its prey and sucks it dry. Most of the time you don't always see these guys um, because they tend to stay at the base of the plant during the day but every now and then when you turn over a leaf which if you ever want to really look for insects you got to turn the leaves over and that that's when you really find what you're looking for and you see here in the right pit right picture I have turned over a leaf and right there I see two hoover fly larvae maggots helping the aphid population on this plant. They'll actually go for scale thrips aphids and they overwinter as larvae in leaf litter. So you know um, um, you know, uh, I know this is beneficial insects, but when I also talk about pollinators and butterflies, 
and we fi we're starting to find that that a lot of these insects are overwintering in our leaf litter and so when we sit here in the fall and we decide we're going to clean it up and make it look perfectly pristine we're actually doing the wrong thing when it comes to insect beneficial insects pollinators and butterflies you know the only reason that you would really need to clean up your um, garden debris in the fall is if you had a disease or a bad insect infestation so um, otherwise if it's you know um, you know like your rubecchia just let them let them be and, and don't cut them back until the spring um, I know that might be a, a change in the way you garden but um, it'll help some of the overwintering pollinators butterflies and beneficial insects Okay, so I digress. Let me go back to the Hoover fly, make sure I say everything. I love this guy. I mean, I think he's so cool. And uh, he just, like, in 7 to 10 days, this guy can eat hundreds of aphids. So you wouldn't necessarily always, unless you, get, you know, get lucky and turn over a leaf and you see them right there, know you have this guy, but you know what the adult looks like. And so if you have the adult and you have aphids in your garden, you are probably are getting the benefit from this aphid-eating maggot. We're going to go to the ladybugs. You would not believe how many people I could show an image of a ladybug larva and they do not know that it's a ladybug. Um, fine, sure, sometimes they look black at first. They actually go through several different instars throughout their larva life stage. So some of them look, you know, black at first and then they turn colors and you see just in these two larvae how different they are. So, um, this guy um, just as common for me I find this guy just as much as I find the aphid lion or just as much as I find the hoover fly larva again I'm usually turning over insects insects turning over leaves looking for them they will eat their favorite preferred food is aphids but again it's another it's a small bodied um, small-bodied uh, uh, in, in insect and so on this right picture you actually see two of the life stations you see a uh, ladybug larva that is probably close to its its final size and then next to it you see a ladybug pupa now this is going to Yes, it's going to turn into what you think a ladybug looks like. Now, you know how most of the time I talked about how ladybugs, uh, usually it's the larva that eats the meat and the adults eat the pollen and nectar or say the honeydew. Well, this one, the adult, acts as a beneficial insect, too, and will eat the aphids. But actually, the larva is much more of a voracious eater. This is a gorgeous picture of, uh, from Alex Wilde, again, that is, shows a ladybug larva. I mean, he looks like the lion or the alligator. It, sucking the juices dry of um, an aphid. You actually, on the right, you see aphid caskins, which are, you know, when an aphid goes through its instars, um, it releases its skin. So that's what, when you see those little white things everywhere, that's the skin. And then on the left, you actually see aphids that have already been parasitized by wasps. So um, again, now you see really why I love going to a garden and finding an infestation of aphids because it normally means I'm going to find a lot of insects, a lot of beneficial insects. So even though we hate us, uh, these um, Asian lady beetles in our winter homes, they are beneficial too. And 
um, they were actually released for soybean aphids and um, they're from Asia so they don't have um, they're they're used to overwintering in the cliffs and so since we don't have very many cliffs in Illinois or even any I don't know for sure the closest thing is your house and so that's why they go in there yeah I know they stink and sometimes bite um, just go ahead and work on your um, exclusion is really one of your only um, remedies for Asian lady beetles that come in your house the good thing is is they're not going to um, reproduce in your house but um, they they're they're good insects even though we don't like them in our house next one this one is perfect I could not have more perfect timing for the cicada killer because it's really they they start to come out when the cicadas begin to sing so um, that should be late July early August so they're really quite a menacing looking wasp um, this uh, picture on the right is from a master naturalist named Deanna Frouchy. She's a wonderful um, photo taker. And uh, she, catch, she um, is showing one, a female, taking a cicada back to her nest. So what she does is she paralyzes the cicada. She's taking the cicada back to a ground nest. She, she, she uses tools or even her mouth to dig a nest in the ground then what she does is she puts the paralyzed cicada in there lays a couple of eggs on it she might even put a couple more paralyzed cicadas in the bottom and then she'll chamber off that particular um, egg laying part and then she'll keep doing the same thing over and over so she's going back getting the cicadas parasitizing them taking them to the nest laying an egg on them to make sure her babies have food they need now she doesn't eat the cicadas she eats pollen and nectar and you guys know this because you see her and the spider killer which are those big black ones constantly they're amazing pollinators they're constantly pollinating flowers well some people are scared of the cicada killers because they will come up to you now it's only the male that will come up to you and the male is completely unable to stink the only reason he's coming up to you is he's making sure that you're not another male now she can stink but the only reason that she would do that she's not going to do that just to sting she's going to do that if you've perhaps handled her or disturbed her nest now they like to um, excavate their nest in open ground so if you truly don't want this person this this guy there which you know maybe you have a child or maybe you have a dog and that's not something you want in your yard you need to make sure you don't have open ground but if you like the benefit of beneficial insects it goes to show you that you know it seems like you know when we talk hort we're always like oh do this no don't do this so you know we always talk about the benefits of mulch but you think about the mulch actually inhibits ground nesting bees and ground nesting wasps so if that's something that you are, are you know cool with which I am I love ground nesting bees I'm going to allow um, a, you know patches uh, open patches in my lawn or an open patch near my perennial bed so again uh, the males they look very menacing and if they've approached you they can't sting you they're not going to do anything so there's no reason to run away and they're amazing beneficial uh, insects and uh, actually my most amazing part the thing that I think this most amazing thing about the cicada killer is that it's able to use tools like rocks to dig and to pat down or use its head um, what a cool um, 
adaption. So, and then I like to make fun of the the fact that the man, the male of the species, doesn't get to sting, but he's you know all puffing out his chest and comes and um, gets in your face. But uh, again, not as menacing as you think. But you would not believe how many people bring in these guys and want to know what they are. Uh, my next one is one that um, we definitely released in the in the greenhouse, and I see all the time. Uh, it's called a minute pirate bug. Some people call them noceums, which is not right. Uh, it's inaccurate. Just like some people call the Hoover fly sweat bees. Um, these guys are. If I tell you, you're gonna know exactly what they are. It, when they when they start harvesting, and it's it bites you, and it's kind of like a mosquito, but it uh, bites you, and it'll leave behind a welt, and it's usually around the fall. This is what this guy is. This is a minute pirate bug. Now again, yes, he is biting you. He's probing. So he's got one, one stylet mouth part, and he's just probing you. So he's not like, he doesn't have teeth. He's not biting you. He's just probing you. And it does leave behind, um, you know, a rather nasty uh, mark. So I agree that, you know, I hate it when they come out and they're in, in a really big abundance. But they are ferocious when it comes to eating but any insect pest that you have. Now, one of the things that I, we had problems with is we didn't have a lot of insect, beneficial insects that we could release for thrips. I mean, we had tons for um, spider mites and aphids and mealybugs, but thrips, you know, this, this is the one we did. And he was, like I said, voracious. I meant just would eat them up. And what we would do is we would actually go out and aspirate them, which means I had a little glass jar and I'd suck them up into the glass jar and come back and release them at my house. But we did actually um, release them, would order them off the internet and release them too. Now, not the best insect to maybe release in your garden because guess what they're going to fly away but in the greenhouse was pretty appropriate you see that's not my nail because it actually has kind of beautiful nails that's Heather Lash's nail and what has come it's in a liter container with some cocoa um, holes and there's adult minute pirate bugs in there and she's just going to go around and sprinkle those cocoa holes around her room. And they're going to give her um, some control of thrips. And thrips, if you ever go up to a flower and you blow on it or you dump the flower in your hand, you'll see these little tiny insects running around. Well, they eat pollen. And they're bad when you want seeds. And when you do research on soybeans, you always want seeds. It's always about the genetics. So these were actually a wonderful tool for, uh, for us. So, but if you see them in your backyard, you know, it's not something you should be totally worried about. Yes, I know they're, they can be menacing to us, but they're actually really good insects and they're going to eat up whatever pest you have. You see at the right picture, you actually have a larva, um, a nymph, excuse me. This one goes through, uh, uh, no, it goes through complete, a larva, yes. Um, white line sphinx moth. I always put this in there because I actually just had a master gardener say, this, this caterpillar just ate up all my pentas. And it was a sphinx moth. It was a hornworm. And it was at a butterfly garden, so, you know, I was like, don't kill it, just let it eat them. And she was like, okay, no problem. But I've seen this one eat sun drops um, a lot, and um, it actually is supposed to eat, um, you know, in the literature, it's always like apples and pears. And it's not really that huge of an insect pest, but it's a really colorful insect. It actually turns into 
a beneficial insect. Yes, I know I'm stretching when I say beneficial insect because it's a pollinator. And what is so beautiful about these white line sphinx moths is they have these huge proboscis that will actually pollinate really difficult to pollinate um, flowers. So I just wanted you to be able to see the larva of this beautiful insect so you don't kill it off. So if it eats all your Onothera or even your Pentas, eh, it's okay because eventually you're helping produce this beautiful white line sphinx moth. Now these actually come out more in the fall and they come out at dusk. So and it will be like you're seeing a hummingbird because they're unusual. They're unlike other butterflies and moths in the fact that they really stay in flight when they're feeding other moths and butterflies land. So, um, and it, it really can be a beautiful um, sight. Another, this white line sphinx moth is very common. Another very common one is the clear wing sphinx moth. And um, I just, I, 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 even though you're supposed to see them more towards dawn, and I do, I do see them in the day too, but I tend to not see them till later in the summer. So be on the lookout for this guy. You don't have fall blooming stuff in your garden then he's probably not going to be there. So make sure you have something blooming in your garden in the fall. Here's uh, um, another transition. We have um, uh, a hornworm that is a pest, and this is your tomato hornworm or your tobacco hornworm. He turns into the five-spotted hawk moth. But it's still a beautiful moth, not quite as beautiful as the white line sphinx moth, but quite beautiful. And we have a, usually, you know, these tomato hornworms can be quite frustrating if you're growing some tomatoes and you come out and you see all, and you see like your plant looks kind of bare and you go up there and you're like, man, something is eating all these leaves. And even though this thing is giant, it's hard to see it sometimes. But it usually isn't until I see the white pupa on the back of the tomato hornworm that I don't really uh, see it. Um, so if you actually saw um, a tomato hornworm with these white pupil sacs on them, then you know I don't have to spray because this is going to take care of it. So what happens is the, the adult wasp lays her eggs on the tomato hornworm. It either multiplies by um, 32 or 64 and the larva begin to feast on the blood of the hornworm. Um, they're going to be careful in the beginning as not to touch the vital organs because they want to grow to maturity. So they keep the host alive. So they only eat the blood. Then when they're growing towards maturity, then they they will um, eat some of the organs and uh, eventually, ultimately, kill the tomato hornworm. But the one thing that happens is once it is parasitized, it does stop eating. Um, these little um, parasitic wasp larvae um, are inside the tomato hornworm. They have little saw-like teeth. They cut their way out of the caterpillar and then they spin little silken cocoons. And that's what you see. You see the pupa. I always, it, we always, everybody always mistakens these for eggs. These are not eggs. These are the pupil sacs. And, um, you know, you have future pest control. You would never want to take this off or um, just let it stay. Eventually, it'll go away and dry up, and a bird may eat it. But um, it just goes to show you something that's a horrible pest, especially if you would like your garden fresh tomatoes, actually turns into a beautiful insect. Uh, we have praying mantis. We know that praying mantis don't care what they eat. 
They'll eat your bees, your wasp, your flies. But I always say they're a really good indication of uh, a healthy garden. Now, um, I had uh, we have a master gardener here named Ellen Culver who decided to uh, send us some pictures of these um, beautiful uthicas. Yes, I said uthicas because that's what they are. They're they're um, egg cases. They have masses of eggs in there, which they've hardened, and that is how they overwinter. Um, in the spring, this Uthaka will come alive, and there will be thousands of tiny ba baby praying mantises. And they'll start coming out and running. And, you know, they'll eat looking for food, and they'll eat each other if they have to, because praying mantises will eat whatever it can get its hands on, or its little clasping front legs. And um, it does chew. I've actually seen them catch a bee and take it down in like, you know, seconds. Um, but they do go for bees and wasps and flies. Um, it, it is a, a incomplete metamorphosis. So they look like tiny praying mantises and they just keep growing old. Now this one's a Chinese praying mantis. This is not from here. But still, it's the one that's big, green. Um, it has a hard wing on the top. It you it 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 will fly if it, it you know mostly if it's a, a male, or if it's completely disturbed. It will raise up. Um, but most of the time, they are waiting still for their prey. The next one is a Carolina praying mantis, much smaller, but the um, not gr not quite as green. But you know, I, I see it all the time around here. You see the the Uthica is completely different. It's like flattened um, rather than this big bulbous, and it just goes to show you again, you know, where you're cut. Let's say you were cutting back your, and that this previous picture was. Um, Ellen was waiting till the spring to cut back um, some of her shrubs. And so once she saw this, she knew, oh, I have beneficial insects coming. We'll wait a little bit more. And so she knew that she wanted to keep these praying mantises in their garden because they would get rid of some of the bad bugs for her. So when she went to cut back in the spring, she decided to wait a little bit longer for this one because she knew she had the Uthicas. Another thing she could have done, which she might have done this, is just cut it from the uh, plant and kept it somewhere in the garden. Um, it doesn't have to be attached to a living plant. Um, for them to still hatch and still be beneficial for her garden. Um, and then this is this is uh, the one that um, it's called the damsel bug. I actually said for this one I was like um, I saw it in um, a book. And this was you know when I first started this career six years ago. I had never seen it before in my life. And I said I'm and you can tell why I've never seen it before because it's awfully small and inconspicuous. And I saw it in a book, a Phil, a Phil Nixon book, a Phil Nixon, one of his cards. And I said, I am bound and determined to find, find this insect. And it took me a while, but I did the, actually, the, I see it's on the Xenia on the left, but actually on the right. I found it on snapdragons. Now, if you look lower below the the bottom most flower, there's squash bugs eggs on there, and they were actually eating those eggs. Now, I wish they would do a better job of eating squash bug eggs, but um, it was really cool to see them um, uh, there, and I just really, really had to scout the garden. Again, they're going to eat things that are smaller than them, and they're pretty dainty. I've seen them on a aphid-infested Nicotiana before, uh, flowering tobacco. Um, but they're not my most common things to see. And, and again, you see why, because they're so small. But um, again, I was bound to determine to find them. I found them, and they are really good insects. They actually fly, too. 
So um, uh, I challenge you to go out and find some damsel bugs. Assassin bugs are great. This is one of the um, one of the wonderful things in the industry um, is potato growers have decided to use beneficial insects. And, you know, beneficial insects, even though they've been around for a while, especially with greenhouses and nurseries, and we're starting to really, really get into using them. We still haven't, like, completely adopted the practice. But potato growers are growing them because what we have here is we have Colorado potato beetle and it's a larva and you know they're getting a lot of pesticide resistance with Colorado potato beetle so they f are finding that if they have you know a proper environment for assassin bugs the assassin bugs will actually um, come and take care of the larva for them now it this is a nymph of an assassin bug it's not a complete adult they usually have bright colors um, and what they're doing is they're advertising that they are going to have a painful bite uh, yes this one's probably going to bite you if you were to pick it up and handle it but can you imagine the damage that it's going to do to all these Colorado potato beetle larvas so um, what a cool um, you see these guys you never want to stomp on them you never, uh, they really like ground covers. I usually see them more near um, uh, native vegetation. Uh, wonderful. Spiders. Oh, spiders are so awesome. I mean, have you had a person go, uh, 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 have you had people tell you that you've gotten spider bites or you wake up with the mysterious bite of something and it's a spider well if you're an educated person knows that it's probably not a spider it's probably something else it's probably an allergy and being a horticulturist I don't know for sure but um, I put in here um, unless you're sleeping on the basement floor a spider might wander onto your bed as often as twice a year but not every night so if you take certain precautions like don't sleep in the basement or have your blankets not touch the floor you're never going to come into contact with a spider even if it does it's usually not going to bite you they have no reason to bite a human they are not blood suckers and in fact they're probably not even aware of your existence so um, they're wonderful. I love having spiders. Um, I like them in my garage and in my basement. It's cool. They're eating the bad bugs. Um, they um, are, you know, great predators for your garden. Um, so we don't have to all hate spiders. Now, I did a spider presentation for Master Gardener Coordinators, and they helped me find this one um, uh, colorful handout on the top. It's wonderful to be able to identify more spiders. Um, I have to go back to Phil Nixon, the good guys, natural enemies. These cards are amazing. Um, you probably already have them in your... Uh, master Gardener office, but or if you don't, go to Pubs Plus and get these. I mean, they're laminated cards. You can put them in your garden thing, and you can just flip through them. They're amazing pictures, great information. Really tells you, you know, when you can go. Oh, is that a good guy or a bad guy? It's wonderful. Um, I did, you know, take a lot of photos from some friends, and so I wanted to give them some photo resources. Um, I love Whitney Cranshaw. He is my favorite author when it comes to insects. And I use these two books every week. Uh, I know it's I know I'm a horticulture educator and I do do a lot of stuff with insects. But I love just being able to look up more about a particular insect. So there, these are Garden Insects of North America and Bugs Rule. They should either be in your Master Gardener library, or if you're really big into insects and you want to teach, they should be in your personal library.
I have a blog called Flowers, Fruits, and Frass. You don't have to ask me what frass means because it means insect poop, right? And great alliteration. So um, I like to talk about insects, clearly, and some of the stuff that's happening in my unit. And, um, you know, I release other things all the time. So if you're at all interested, go check out my blog. And with that, do I have any questions? Aw, speakers always get disappointed when you don't ask them a question. Somebody could ask me a question. Well, that's okay. You can always, oh, go ahead, champagne, type it in. But you can always email me. If you have a question on insects, I know I was on vacation last week and got have a few questions that I haven't answered yet. So if that's you, please be patient. I just haven't gotten around to it. Martha, am I am I? Not hearing. Oh, okay. Am I not hearing the question? Has um, the they're, wasp they're... already laid eggs in the hornworm before I see it? Most likely. Most likely. Um, especially if it's kind of lethargic. Um, but uh, I usually don't see it until the pupae come out. So it takes probably about two days after the egg is laid before the larva begin to feed and about seven days for the larva to feed. So um, it, it could be that nine days before, but um, if they're not aggressively eating, they've probably been parasitized. So there's several, several kinds of, hu of hummingbird moss. I think uh, I just looked it up. Um, let me look it up really quick. I think there were like 1,700 species. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and just because I talked about the two most common, it's kind of crazy that I talk about two when there's thousands of species. Let me see. What did it say? It said... Hmm... It must have been a different book, um, but my Bugs Rule book, it, it talks about a few of them, but it doesn't tell me how many species they are, there are. But I would just assume there's several hundred species. Um, I am pleased with the caterpillars on my parsley for butterfly. Can this parsley be consumed after caterpillars no longer present? I do not see why not. Because, um, you know, I I don't know well I I make fun of parsley all the time because it's not the best herb in the world. I don't love it. I only grow it for the um black swallowtail caterpillars, but once they're gone, you're fine. What are the benefits of daddy long legs? Tend to see them in the house. Um well, um daddy long legs um you know, it's like I have pet roaches and everybody asks me, why do we need roaches? Well, I bet you something parasitizes. There's some parasitic wasp out there that parasitizes daddy long legs. But I do not know specifically what their benefit is. I'm sure they are wonderful to have in the house. Is a walking stick bug a good bug or a bad bug? I wouldn't consider it either. Um, it eats leaves. Um, 
on plants so um, then it lays its eggs and uh, when it, it what, what's cool about walking sticks is when they lay their eggs they lay a sticky appendage onto the eggs that way the ants on the ground will actually carry the eggs around so um, you know I would just consider them really cool insects so you know I've never ever had somebody come up to me and you know uh, again I've not been an entomologist for as long as Phil Nixon has but um, or even have his credentials but I've never heard of anybody say I have a walking stick bug infestation and usually they're quite rare to find but um, supposedly you can lay a white cloth underneath a tree and if you beat the tree they'll fall off um, and they eat vegetation so I think they're really cool I actually want one as a pet living in your limestone walls very cool to watch them dragging and stuffing a cicada I am so happy that you're happy about the cicada killers because you would not believe how many questions come into our master gardener help desk. Well, what what can I what can I spray on them? And I'm like, oh, nothing. I'm not telling you. Hey, yo, uh, you know when you have the ground bees too. Nobody wants the ground bees, but they're really cool to watch. And eh, so they mess up your lawn. Who cares? Um, sorry, Richard. Yeah, um, so what I would do is, you know, when I look for beneficial insects is I turn over leaves, I really inspect, I look for poop, I know, I look for frass, and that can really tell you a lot about looking in your garden, um, I look for holes, uh, any damage, I turn it over and really inspect it, so I may, I'm glad you guys are already seeing all of this stuff. Is diatomaceous earth a good insecticide? It depends. If you have a pet, no. And it depends what you're actually using it for. I don't think it's efficient on some things. I definitely would read the label and do exactly what it says. And you know something else? Um, you need to be careful with you because you can inhale it and it can cause damage to you. So even though it is a beneficial or biological pesticide or considered safe or organic, it still can damage you or pets. So if I, you know, so I just want you to take that caution. But it can be a very efficient tool, especially for slugs. I would love to do, um, and you know, Kari and Martha and Candace may take me up on it, um, a, um, a presentation on uh, biological pesticides um, to show you some alternatives uh, I just don't know how you know glamorous that title would be but it would uh, um, be kind of cool to teach you know gardeners you know hey you don't always have to use the carbon mates and the organophosphates there are other alternatives is there any bug that will reduce Japanese beetle popular ha 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 he he you know, uh, they talk about cardinals eating Japanese beetles all the time, um, but, you know, you'd think you'd have like an influx in cardinal activity, but, um, you know, I'm sure uh, there's, um, might be some, I don't know. I'd have to say I don't know on that. But what a great question. Like cardinals, chickens, 
bats, but is there a bug? I'm not totally for sure. There might be something that tries to um, parasitize it in the ground, but I'm not totally for sure. That's just a guess. But have you noticed that, I don't know if this is for all over the state, that I, we have not had the Japanese beetle pressure here this year that we had last year. And I, I know that it did freeze. Um, it was, The ground was frozen down pretty deep here in McLean and even, you know, my Livingston and Woodford. But uh, I've... Just wondered if that was all over the state. I guess it's not. I knew there would be hot pockets. I knew it was too good to be true. I'm sorry for your raspberries. Okay, well... I am going to go ahead and log off. I'm already five minutes over, and uh, if you know me, I want to be on time and done because I don't want to sit here and talk for an hour and 40 minutes. So with that, if you have any more questions, please, please email me. My name is Kelly Alsip. I will probably do another PowerPoint presentation next year. Thank you, Martha, Kari, and Candice for all of your hard work in helping put together this awesome program.